I'm Richard Clay. I'm an art historian. I don't just study the creation of art, I study its destruction. In many ways, I study the history of art from below. In this film, I'm going to tell the story of the French Revolution through the destruction of art, buildings and symbols. These are often used by those in power as weapons to enforce the status quo. In a revolution, the destruction and transformation of art and symbols is a way to turn the tables. It's called iconoclasm. The inside story of great revolutions can be uncovered through the smashed, altered and reshaped art of the past. This is a story about art, it's a story about symbols, it's a story about the power of a monarchy, the power of the church, the power of aristocracy. Were the French revolutionaries just a mob? Why were their governments so afraid of them? This is the history of art. This is a story about the breaking of images. It's a story of the city being transformed through destruction, arguably the birth of the modern world. The French Revolution of 1789 changed the world. Inspired by the Enlightenment notions of liberty, equality and brotherhood, the people of France tore control of their destiny from the king, nobility and church, giving birth to a new way of seeing the world around us. The revolution was a war whose battlefield was the visual world, where the symbols of royal, religious and aristocratic power had long controlled people's lives. Revolutionaries took these symbols and they destroyed them, creating a new political order. The word vandalism was invented to describe them. But I don't think that they were mindless barbarians. This battle over who controlled Paris began 24 kilometers outside the city, here in Versailles. Begun in 1632, King Louis's forebears expanded the Palace of Versailles to boast an astonishing 750 rooms with extravagant gardens covering 800 hectares. This building was the ultimate expression of French royal power. Versailles is famous for being an extravagant piece of architecture with beautiful art. That's all true, but it's also the heart of Ancien Regime government. The king's apartments are a tiny fraction of this vast palace. The rest of it, it's administration, as well as servants, of course. And that's the important thing for the revolution. This is where government is done. This is the place to come to get decisions made. For all its gold leaf, I'm not here to visit the Palace of Versailles, because the French Revolution effectively began nearby in this unassuming back street at the Royal Tennis Courts. I've genuinely studied the revolution for almost half my life. I've never been in this space before. It's amazing. This is the truth. This is probably, for me at least, the most important place in recent French history. In 1789, the French world of politics was in turmoil, divided into three groups called estates, the church at the top, nobility in the middle, and everybody else at the bottom. The French people were hungry and angry and taxed heavily by a cash-strapped elite. France is effectively bankrupt. They keep losing wars. It's an expensive business. So the king says, I rule by divine right. I request that representatives of the three estates that make up French society come to Versailles and help me find a way of getting my accounts in order. The third estate 
and its champions in the press start to say, well, we're the vast majority of the French people. Surely we should have more representatives than everybody else. And when they tried to gather, the king refused to let them meet in the allotted space and found the doors locked. So they came to the tennis court and they swore an oath. They swore that they would sit in perpetuity until a constitution was written for France. This is the moment when constitutional politics is born. Jacques-Louis David's painting of the tennis court, it seems to be such a scene of consensus, all these arms thrusting to the centre towards Bailly, who's leading this oath. But it isn't entirely a scene of consensus. We've got a figure in the bottom right-hand corner who sits gesturing, firmly holding his arms to his chest. He is not going to raise his arm and swear this oath. It's too big. Robespierre stands clutching his chest He's realizing the enormity of the moment. He's not a renowned figure yet, but as we all know, he certainly will gain a reputation. And in the very center, just at the feet of Bailly, there's Sies, who's such a key writer in the run-up to this event. And he sits as if in the eye of the storm, totally still, as if contemplating what his writing has unleashed. This is the birth of modern France. The world has been turned upside down. It's no longer about the divine right of kings. It's about power, sovereignty emanating from below. It's the power of the people. For the first time in their history, the people had a representative government. The king, his nobles and the church were losing their control over the people's lives and the world around them. A symbolic world that daily demonstrated the power of king, church and aristocracy. For aristocrats, art was primarily an intellectual experience. Perhaps the first thing they'd observe on approaching this painting would be, oh, look at this masterly final touch of the painter that brings the surface of the painting to life. Look at this astonishing fold in this fabric described with a single brush stroke or oh, the spontaneity of the artist and his genius. This is an aesthetic object. It's also an object that tells a moral story. This is a young girl looking boldly at the viewer with a bird on a finger. But in the history of art, this elite would know. A bird in a cage is virginity. A bird that's escaped a cage is lost virginity. This is a girl who's confident about her sexual virtue, holds a bird on a finger. There is an element of morality for the viewer to discuss. But perhaps most importantly, for them, it's a fabulous painting. It has aesthetic value. With their extensive education, the French aristocracy and middle classes enjoyed nothing better than showing off their knowledge over a snapshot of mythical life. The racier, the better. This is a historical painting. The subject, Diana, goddess of hunting, at her bath. A fellow called Actian, a mythical peeping Tom, is watching her from the bushes. And she sees him, and she turns him into a stag, and it has him hunted down. It's a warning to the voyeur. That kind of interpretation of this object was only really open to those people who had a vast knowledge of antiquity and of mythology, highly educated, highly educated, and a tiny elite particularly made up of an aristocracy who weren't allowed to work for a living, who lived the kind of leisured life we see depicted here, who used their knowledge of the past to mark their social distinction and justify their role in society. But in a way, isn't this rather like the way that we 
think about art today too. That we go to the Louvre and we can demonstrate our knowledge of aesthetics. And we queue to see the Mona Lisa to be able to say we've seen something of historical value. The fact that we today share this way of looking at art as a cerebral adventure suggests we've forgotten how powerful and controlling art could be for the people of France in 1789. For the majority of Parisians, through religion, art had a power to literally change their worlds. Here, Santa Genevieve, on her knees, beseeches the Virgin Mary to ask God to intercede and save people suffering because of drought. Every religious image has this potential, not just to save your soul, but also to help address the challenges of existence. For most people, religious art was an immersive and very real experience that helped them elevate their minds to God, whose power could change the world. This painting from the 18th century shows this was a kind of 18th century sculptural installation. These women aren't here to contemplate the brilliance of this sculptural work. They're not interested in aesthetics, nor in history. These women are here in the hope that Christ and God will help them in their day-to-day -day struggles. Diderot, the great philosopher of the 18th century, said that he thought that this chapel was theatrical. He thought it was dangerous that its immersive environment encouraged the poor particularly, but people in general, to suspend their disbelief, just as if they were at a theater. It's precisely this fear of the role that images can play in people's lives that leads them to become such contested objects during the revolution. It was during the very first crisis of the French Revolution that art was used as a weapon in the struggle between those with power and those without. With the assembly threatening the power of the king, rumours had spread that royalist troops were gathering outside Paris. The people were furious. Their target was a fortified gateway into Paris where astronomic customs duties were raised on imports into the city. Known as the Barrière de la Confrance, it no longer exists today. To Parisians, it was a hated building loaded with economic and political significance. The 12th of July 1789, the Parisians were walking out of Paris and they were walking out of Paris to the Barrière de la Conference on the route to Versailles. They wanted to get to Versailles, they wanted to see the king. But when they get there, they stop and what they do is they attack the Barrière de la Conference, which was just at this site. But really interestingly, this mob of vandals, this ignorant bunch of barbarians, had turned up with stonemasons and their tools. This sounds like they might have had a plan. Next to the barrier, there were statues. One of those statues, a female figure, has a shield. On the shield are the fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis are the symbols of royal France. This is, as far as the crowd are concerned, a symbol of royal France. The stonemasons are there because they have a plan. Their plan is to decapitate the statue. And that is precisely what they do. Many historians of the revolution cite this as the first example of mindless mobs committing acts of wanton vandalism. I disagree. This moment of unrest, of violence, although nobody's wounded, but violence against property isn't meaningless, it's meaningful. This statue at the gates of Paris in 1789 says to anybody who's entering Paris from Versailles that royalist France is like a body politic without a head. This powerful symbol is not the product of the behavior of ignorant vandals. Dr. Guillaume Mazot at the Sorbonne 
has been looking at what made the revolutionaries tick. Were they the violent mob of popular myth? These popular protests, these in some cases armed protests, yes. uh, are these the protests of, of mobs? No, uh, a lot of these protesters want to avoid violence, not because they are peaceful people, but they knew that the uh, royal dragoons can um, stop this protest by violence. So uh, we can't say that it is a mob because uh, these protesters are not influenced by their only their emotion, their passions, their irrational behaviors. But they have what is quite new is that these protesters act um, in a very modern way. What makes these protests of July 1789 so strikingly modern because they are influenced by other revolutions of the 18th century i mean by the american revolution but also about uh, by the european revolutionists and they perfectly knew uh, what is what freedom means what equality means so it's not a mob it's a it's a political protest mm. deep within the archives of the bibliothèque nationale Prints from the period use the symbolism of the headless royal statue to show us the reality of the situation. And this decapitated statue seems to me is a key part of the composition. The king no longer is just the simple head of state that he once was. Now something new has to emerge. A member of the people standing where the head was. They are now sovereign. Even today, transforming symbols of power through modification and destruction is still a provocative form of protest. Deep under the streets of Paris are the remains of perhaps the greatest act of iconoclasm of the whole French Revolution. These stones are all that remains today of the huge royal jail, the Bastille, the ultimate symbol of royal despotism. But the revolutionaries turned it from a symbol of cruelty into an emblem of freedom. In the days before the storming of the Bastille, Parisians were, to say the least, agitated. They'd been concerned that the city was surrounded by royal troops, and it was. We get. Parisians starting to arm themselves. And the reason they storm the Bastille is Parisians are furious. They want to take over the prison because they want the guns and the gunpowder that they believe are in there. That's why they march on this symbol. But it is also incredibly symbolically significant. It is the symbol of despotism. After a day-long siege, the Bastille's defenders were overwhelmed. Soon, the situation turned ugly. The prison governor was decapitated by the angry crowd and his head stuck on a pike. The people who'd stormed the Bastille begin to demolish it. This incredibly powerful symbol of royal despotism is being raised to the ground, brick by brick, by the people themselves. This is a Place de la Bastille the greatest, biggest, emptiest space probably left by an act of iconoclasm in Paris. For me, the siege of the Bastille led to one of the great symbolic transformations. It lies here in a storehouse in Rouen, a hundred kilometers from Paris. Straight after the fall of the Bastille in July 1789, the Commune, a new revolutionary government of Paris, were hearing that the people of Paris had started to dismantle the Bastille. The Commune decided they needed to take action. They needed to show that the violence was over, that they were in control of space, and that included all acts of violence against powerful symbols. The official responsible for the dismantling of the Bastille, Pierre, François Palois understood the powerful messages communicated by symbols. He produced dozens of models of the building and sent them to all 83 départements of France. Now, 
the Bastille no longer symbolised the despotic power of royalty. As a result, this kind of plaster model ended up being circulated around France by Palois in his entrepreneurial mode so that groups of French people could celebrate this act of um, iconoclasm, others would call it vandalism, I wouldn't, and they could march together in revolutionary festivals, perhaps on Bastille Day. It's just such a beautifully detailed piece of work the windows, two of them, still bear bars. It makes me wonder whether Palois and his team are actually using metal from the Bastille. Certainly, much of the metal that was salvaged from the site was being cast into souvenirs and sold. Whether or not it's from the Bastille, every single set of windows bears the signs of having had bars as a really prominent reminder of what a fortress prison this really was. This isn't just an incredibly detailed model of the Bastille, it's a message that's being sent to the Departement of France. That the storming of the Bastille wasn't just the efforts of the Parisians, it was an effort made by the nation on behalf of the whole nation. The storming of the Bastille frightened the new Parisian government. They needed to take control of the situation and they needed money their eyes turned to the wealth of the churches of Paris in what was to be the first act of officially sponsored iconoclasm. The clergy of saint sulpice were incredibly well connected. They knew the law was going to change and that silverware would be demanded from them in October 1789. So they gave a lot of it away in late September. The church leaders beseeched the revolutionaries to spare their massive silver statue of Mary. This statue was particularly symbolic because it was made from the old silver that had been given to the clergy by parishioners, melted down to create this incredible sculpture by Bouchard on. But as the revolution progressed, it became clear that the statue was going to have to be melted down, that a request made by a pamphleteer in the name of the Virgin Mary that it should be used for charitable purposes to help the nation was going to have to be met. And it wouldn't stop there. As the revolution had progressed, often beyond the control of the authorities, so the calls for ever more radical iconoclasm would increase. Paris is a city of revolution. They've had five in total since the Bastille was stormed. Like the revolution of 1789, the anti-capitalist riots of 1968 engulfed most of the city. Known as the Soixante-Huit Arts, the young radicals who manned the barricades are still around. Perhaps one of their number, Serge Abadam, can give me an insight into how a revolution acquires a life of its own. The first time I was involved in a violent demonstration was at that time when they saw them acting like, like a mob. They were using those wooden clubs and uh, hitting people that way. On the middle of the street, there were many people there and they were hitting as heavily as they could. I was astonished. I was on the side. I was not involved at the time. Two hours later I was. Really? Definitely. So the people who are beginning to act as a group, asking the liberty of their streets and movement. Did you have a sense of the fact that you were part of a, a French tradition, a legacy? Oh, yes, we did. The, those days in May when we built barricades in the upper Latin district there, and people thought they were in a tradition, raising those barricades. The search really set me thinking about what it was like on the 12th of July or the 14th of July. And I started to get a sense of how what starts as a small group of protesters can rapidly expand into an entire society in rebellion. It's an astonishing frontline insight. Like the uprising of 1968, 
revolutionary fervor spread throughout the city in 1789. The old world of church and aristocracy was now officially under attack, and the marks of this destruction of the old world are still embedded in the walls of the city today. There's nothing more familiar in cities than their walls, but it's odd how quickly the familiar can become strange. Latin graffiti on the wall of a 17th century church. Omnia communia, everything belongs to all. Then iron bars sticking out of the wall, rusted. What was hung from these bars? They looked like legs. And then a horizontal piece of concrete above. This was a crucifix. This was pulled down during dechristianization in the French Revolution, 1793 or 4. And then empty walls, a period of peace perhaps in Paris, and a door with a triangle on top with no religious sign. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Across Paris, teams of sculptors began removing the symbols of the hated oppressors of the Ancien Régime, a damaged work of art or even an empty space above a doorway speaks volumes about the power struggle at the heart of the revolution. A door with roundels chipped out. What was here? Fleur de lis all the way up the door, both sides of the door. And two roundels with nothing in them. What was there? Royal signs, religious signs, signs of feudalism, two harmless, armless cherubs holding nothing. Why? Why were their arms chipped off? This single wall of a single church in Paris tells a story of a succession of revolutionary conflicts. This wall also tells a story of contemporary struggle. Omnia communia, Everything belongs to all. The walls speak. We just have to listen and look. The aristocrats and their coats of arms that used to plaster Paris were also in the firing line. So in August 1789, the National Assembly had just abolished feudalism. Very sudden, very total. All of the signs of feudalism that were all over Paris suddenly looked rather out of place and it wasn't particularly good to be an aristocrat with your emblems on the outside of your townhouse. Hence, at a place like this, now the Bibliothèque Historique de la Ville de Paris, it used to be the house of the Lemoignon family. And here we've got a black inlay that's been placed on later, because what would have happened is the Lemoignon family plastered over their coat of arms because they were no longer aristocrats possibly hoping that one day this abolition of the aristocracy will be revoked. As the revolution progressed, the temporary solution of just plastering over the coats of arms of aristocrats was no longer really working. They'd been doing that work, but now they were starting to emigrate. The revolutionary authorities needed a more permanent solution, and this solution was simply to chip out the coats of arms above the townhouses' doorways like this example, incredibly elaborate aristocratic frontispiece, but with a great big empty space in the middle of it. All record of the existence of these families over generations in Paris was being completely erased. Only months into the revolution, and the streets and buildings of Paris had changed significantly. But in the summer of 1789, bread was still too expensive and people were hungry. Dissent spread on the streets of Paris. In October 1789, Paris was hungry. Paris was also angry. This combination of hunger and anger leads to a kind of protest movement that grows. And in due course, 5th of October, several thousand Parisians end up marching out to Versailles and they camp here. And the next day, 
when they head back to Paris, they head back with the royal family. The center of government has moved from Versailles back to Paris. With the royals safely in the heart of Paris, the people could keep their eyes on the king. Now in Paris, King Louis kept his head down, endorsing revolutionary redistribution of church wealth. But Louis was no fool. He knew his family was in danger. They made a fateful decision to try and escape to Marie Antoinette's homeland, Austria, in the summer of 1791. But they were captured at the Austrian border. The family was brought back to Paris in very real danger. This is a moment on the 26th of July, 1791, when the royal family are brought back to Paris, having tried to escape to Varennes. And the people of Paris line the streets, as they always would for a royal entry into the city. But this time they don't cheer. This time they stand in silence. And in many places, they actually stand with their backs to the royal family's carriage. This printmaker's chosen an amazing moment, which is the moment when Louis XVI comes past the statue to Louis XV on the way into the Tuileries Palace. And there are young boys who have clambered up onto the statue of Louis XV, this much detested king, and they're blindfolding the statue as if to say, even Louis XV wouldn't want to see this awful scene of a cowardly king who's abandoned his people and abandoned the revolution. This was a kind of iconoclasm. The revolutionaries used the statue of Louis XV as a weapon of protest against the traitorous king. To find out what they were really trying to achieve, who better to speak to than a modern day so-called vandal? What's the link between us and the revolution? What are we doing here? Well, you reckon you're vandals. You call yourself vandals. He's wearing a t-shirt that says vandal on it. And I write about vandalism during the French Revolution. But I'm saying these people weren't vandals. This wasn't vandalism. They're not blind, ignorant barbarians. They're incredibly smart people and they understand that monuments in public space are being used to try and control them. So they pour shit on their heads or write graffiti on it. Okay. So, why the hell are you a graffiti artist? This whole project was the idea of demonstrating that we're not vandals, but we're truly artists. I like it. In 2010, Parisian graffiti artist So What led a 40-strong team that covered the walls of a huge abandoned supermarket with art. What was the driving force behind this incredible installation of graffiti. When I was 16 year old, I was angry at the world. I wanted to burn and uh, graffiti was a way for me to get at to the world, you know? I had all the reasons in the world to do it. We think we're right to do it. And in a lot of places we are right to do it. What fascinated us is that this place has been heavily squatted, gypsy families. And uh, our government spent a month and a half leading a war on gypsies, dismantling gypsy camps because they cannot do anything about the economy. So they were giving a hard times to the most fragile population in this country. It's really sophisticated art. It's really thought-provoking. I'm just wondering whether you've got a response where anyone's calling it vandalism still. I'll tell you this. The whole idea was to make a statement that uh, they call us vandals, but that's not what we are. You know, we are artists. I mean, I'm clear about that uh, at this age. I might not have been clear about it at 20 years old, but now I am. But uh, this is what the project is. For me, the beauty of this graffiti is that So What and Friends were using a controversial building as a vehicle for protest. Not what I would call vandalism. This is incredibly relevant to what else we've been looking at. We've been looking at how in the 18th century people would transform, physically transform a sculpture, but they'd also talk about it in a different way. So you can take a symbol and transform it, my dear Vandal. Exactly, exactly. V for Vandal. I'm delighted to have met a pair of Vandal. All right, pleased to meet you. I don't think are ignorant barbarians. <laughs> so what? What an astonishing name. So what? 
What I love about So What is that this incredibly avant-garde graph artist sees this historical tradition and this historical tradition is like, I don't know, kind of part of the DNA of the culture of Paris. This culture of resistance, this culture of contestation that just because you can afford to build the massive monument like the Eiffel Tower, that doesn't mean that you're actually in control. Anyone who can hold a pen, a spray can, they have power too. The Parisian ability to take a symbol like the statue of Louis XV and turn it into a witty and cutting attack on a traitorous king is alive and well in the guise of so what. In the summer of 1792, at a public appearance, revolutionaries forced the shamed Louis XVI to wear a red revolutionary bonnet. Now it wasn't just royal statues that were being transformed and used for mockery, it was the king's own body. A man who'd once claimed to rule by divine right is now dangerously close to becoming an all-too-human target. On the 11th of July 1792, the National Assembly declared the country to be in danger from Austrian invasion. Led by the radicals of the Commune, the people went after the king in the Tuileries Palace. On the 10th of August 1792, Parisians, accompanied by National Guards from all of the sections of Paris and by Marseille's troops who had marched all the way from Marseille, to protect Paris from Austrian invasion, stormed up the Tuileries Palace gardens. Halfway down, they faltered, and Temoin de Mericor, a woman, stood up and led the charge. The men, shamed by this leadership, followed her into a hail of musket fire from Swiss Guard. Despite the presence of close to a thousand Swiss mercenaries, the crowd won the day. By the end of that day, Swiss Guard's bodies littered the palace gardens and the entirety of the palace. Almost to a man they were massacred. The people, once they got into the Louvre, found the royal family cowering in the meeting room of the National Assembly. A debate opened up and the Assembly managed to calm down the invaders to a point where they were dispersing. But the next day it became clear that the conclusion of the National Assembly was they would simply suspend the monarchy. To the people of Paris, this was not going to be good enough. What would happen the next day was the statues of kings would begin to topple. Before the revolution, royal power was asserted through statues of kings. It was backed up by the threat of violence. But these statues of kings, these are very specific representations of the monarch. He's enormous. He's Herculean. He's in armour. He carries a martial baton. Tiny little fleur de lis all the way along it. He's a military leader. Behind the power of the king is the power to exert violence on his people if necessary. This is really about the power of the monarchy. Even today, you can find examples of the struggle to control the images around us. On the column in the center of the city, you can find a symbol of Napoleonic power, an eagle. Just below, the modern day artist, Invader, has added one of his creations. Weird thing is, this witty, clever, quite sympathetic intervention in the public space is illegal. But that monstrosity, totally out of keeping with the city, Paris sponsored by Volkswagen, isn't illegal. So who does own the right to make meaning in public space with symbols? The Space Invader artist or global corporations? And on the 11th of August, 1789, it wasn't images of corporate power that got attacked, but the detested royal statue of the king's grandfather, Louis XV. To actually topple a statue is no mean feat. Anybody who's seen the footage of the statue of Saddam Hussein 
being brought down by American Marines during the Gulf War will understand the scale of the task. There, it took an armoured car several attempts to get the statue to the ground. So the Parisians are engaging in a complex engineering task. When they finally get the statue onto the floor, they then begin to break it up. And actually, that's an important gesture because when the National Assembly give the official go-ahead for this kind of unlicensed iconoclasm a couple of days later, they say the debris should be taken to the forge, melted down to create cannons to fire on the armies of kings. This is a material transformation of the statue. The statue itself is going to become a series of powerful military symbols, cannons. Even the much-loved Henri IV was under threat of destruction. Come mid-August 1792, the statues of kings were toppling across the city, but the statue of Henri IV still sitting in the centre of the Pont Neuf. Parisians are trying to decide what they're to do with this much-loved statue of this much-loved king. Were they to pull down even the good King Henri, who they'd constructed as being a sympathiser of the revolution? In the end, they decided they would. The debris toppled. Mercier said, it turns out it wasn't solid bronze after all. They couldn't melt it down to form cannons. The statue is as hollow as the power of kings. Of course, you might be wondering why the statue is still here. This is an inferior copy. It's put up later by royalists after a kind of counter-revolution. How very Parisian. The radical government of Paris, the Commune, becomes increasingly influential. The monarchy was abolished. From now on, members of the National Assembly, like Robespierre, were struggling to limit the Commune's power. All royal symbols were at risk, even those on the front of Paris's cathedral, Notre Dame. The facade of Notre Dame has been restored since, but in 1793, the statues of kings were annoying radicals in the government of Paris. Early September 1793, the controversy over the statues of kings at Notre Dame was reaching a boiling point. On the 5th of September, the National Convention had declared terror to be the order of the day. These were the original terrorists, self-proclaimed. Meanwhile, at Notre Dame, the radical sectionnaires are saying, why have we got these colossal statues of kings still sitting on front of Notre Dame? Dojon, Francois Dojon, a stonemason and his team come down to Notre Dame by order of the authorities and erect an enormous scaffold. And they work their way along these statues of kings. His team got to work surgically chipping off the crowns and royal symbolism like fleur-de-lis from the statues. But this wasn't enough. They had to come down. The noose is pulled round the neck of the statue and the statue is pulled down and it crashes onto the pavement. And this is the major concern in the aftermath of each of these falling from that height for the revolutionary authorities. We've broken the pavement. The debris piled up beside Notre Dame, where a contemporary diarist noticed it was being used as a toilet, and it stank to high heaven. He says, the sight of these objects, the smell of these objects is disgusting, but it's not as awful as the smell of the past that they represent. In a way, I think, he's playing with carnivalesque notions of the role of shit in culture. The funny thing about shit is, whether you're a soldier, a member of the people, or you're a king, you all shit. But not all revolutionaries thought the statues were worthless. The heads were rescued and unofficially preserved for the future. The marks on them hold clues to what the revolutionaries were trying to achieve. In 1793, things hadn't been looking too good for the statues of kings. But the amazing thing is that in 1977, when building work starts on a bank in the basement, discovered, wrapped in plaster, are these remains of the heads of the statues of kings.
This was a deliberate act of preservation. After all, these have been condemned as being grotesque gothics, which is to say, in very bad taste. What we see are some of the traces of the act of breaking. So all of these heads are missing their noses. Now, this seems too incredible a coincidence. Did they all fall flat on their faces from the gallery when they hit the pavé outside of Notre Dame? I don't think so. Clues as to what was going on can be found in recent history too. The cutting out of the faces on the images of despots by revolutionaries, like this defacing of the posters of Gaddafi. Powerful political acts. Were they actively defaced afterwards? Perhaps as they're lying beside Notre Dame being used as a public toilet? That actually seems plausible to me. But is this an act of vandalism? I'm not so sure. 1793 saw more than the destruction of statues. Radicals like Robespierre within the National Assembly introduced a policy of terror, the arrest and execution of those unfaithful to the revolution. Here we are, back on the Place de la Concorde, the kind of beating heart of the terror in Paris. The beating heart, as in the place where all the beating hearts were stopped. The real beating heart is probably the revolutionary tribunals, which are sending people to the guillotine, sometimes with just 24 hours notice. But the guillotine was mounted here. This, the irony of having just across the river nowadays, the Assemblée Nationale, is pretty significant. But this square saw an awful lot of bloodshed. Famous Mr. Guillotine. A machine proposed to the Assemblée Nationale for the punishment of criminals by Monsieur Guillotine. I think we all know how it works. It's quick, it's humane, it's enlightened. And it used to sit in the Place Louis XV. Finally, in early 1793, after being found guilty of treason against France, the king was executed. The statue of Louis XV had been toppled and it's directly opposite the empty pedestal that Louis XVI is executed on the 21st of January, 1793, and his head held up. With the destruction of the royals, the radicals within the government moved on to the other great power, the church. This attack on the church, known as de-Christianization, would engulf the most cherished religious spaces of Paris. This comprehensive attack on Christian France began here at the great cathedral of Notre Dame. On the 10th of November, 1793, radicals from the Commune decide to challenge the authority of God. In the autumn of 1793, a visitor to Notre Dame could have come in and happened upon the first ever festival of reason. And on coming to the crossing of the nave, they might have seen a mountain, and on it, an actress, an actress in a church, who when she died wouldn't even be worthy of being buried in church grounds because she was regarded as being tantamount to a prostitute. And this actress was playing the role of the deity of reason in a ceremony that was a festival of reason. This is an extraordinary moment in the history of this church. Its first day in a new life, not as a church, but as a temple of reason. Notre Dame wasn't alone. Across Paris, the great churches ceased to be Christian and they became temples of reason. Central to their new status, was a state-sponsored campaign, the wholesale removal, alteration, or destruction of religious symbols. On the 5th of September, 1793, the section finally got to hold its first festival of reason. Probably all of these chapels to the side were sealed off with drapery so you couldn't see the imagery. And it's in the pulpit that a local sectionnaire, Serrat, stands and says to his audience, so if this God exists, why doesn't he strike me down right now with a bolt of thunder? And then he 
gazed pregnantly at the ceiling for a moment and says, there you go, no thunder, he doesn't exist. At the end of this ceremony, the whole of the section take two of the wooden statues and they process them to a local square where they burn them. With God banished, next to go were the symbols and art. The sculptor who brought down the kings at Notre Dame, Dojon, worked on the 240 foot high towers of Saint-Sulpice. What was so important that it meant risking life and limb? Francois Dojon's time at Saint-Sulpice, eight weeks, involved making hundreds of changes to the symbolism of the church. But this work right outside is the first thing that revolutionaries visiting the space would have seen. Right over the main door begins with this bas relief of Faith. Here, Faith used to hold a chalice, but instead now she holds a flaming torch that symbolizes the enlightenment that the visitor is going to receive inside. The little cherub beside her once held a cross. Now the cherub holds instead Bashkis. Bashkis is that symbol of Roman unity, also Roman law and order, that eventually becomes the symbol that gives the name to fascists. In this bas relief, the cherub to the left, this time the cross has been turned into a sword, a kind of military symbol, surely. So the real work of Dajon began once he got inside the church. All of these trophies that line the nave high up that are now blank, re-sculpted by Dajon, working at this vast height on scaffolding that his team had brought to the church and assembled there. But working on the high ceiling was just the beginning. Dojon and his team had to go even higher. This graffiti here, we're on the way to the Chapel of the Students, is it some sort of pissy and priest? Oh, great, it's getting narrower. In 1967, somebody last came up here. We're running out of graffiti. It's as if people lose the will to write as they get to this altitude. Perhaps I'm not the only person who's afraid of heights. Above the nave, the interior of the church is covered in graffiti. I just can't resist looking for a hastily scrawled Dojon was here. Who are these men who took the time to carve their names into this wall at this height? Is that a revolutionary? 1808, 1859, 1830, the year of a revolution. Dojon didn't leave his signature behind, it seems. At a height of about 200 feet, I reached the bells. Even these didn't escape the revolution. Wow, the bells, they're all new. During the revolution, they were all pulled down, all but one of them, to turn them into thousands and thousands of coins, each bearing the symbol of the Republic for distribution around the country. That's transformation of symbols. At 240 feet in the air, I can get a sense of the lengths Dojon and his team were going to in their roles as revolutionary iconoclasts. So Dojon, in his report for the work he did at Sans Peace, said, I was working at a really prodigious height and the weather was appalling. And this is kind of why he charged so much. Now I'm up here, I kind of understand what he means. And his team must have been hanging off here or with ropes to chip out the church's signs that are just beneath where I'm standing on this tower. They must have been working in a similar way on the floor down where the bells are, going outside of the safety of the walls to alter the statues. Yeah, they were charging a lot of money 
but even a taking account for inflation as they were, I kind of think they probably deserve the danger money. Dojon might have been an entrepreneur, but he was clearly a committed revolutionary. Between 1793 and 1794, like other teams of Masons, he transformed the churches across Paris. But the deeply ingrained Catholicism of the French people was hard to wipe out. Robespierre, one of the architects of the terror, realized that the revolutionary assembly had allowed the cult of reason to go too far. In 1794, after executing those responsible, he launched a new cult with a new god. On the 8th of June, 1794, Parisians were invited to an enormous festival for a new cult. It was the cult of the Supreme Being. And this festival is to celebrate it. They get to see this incredible spectacle, this enormous mountain built on the Champ de Mars, and then a massive column, which is probably made of papier mache, and on top of it, an enormous figure of Hercules, symbolizing the power of the people. Yet, within just six weeks, this cult was in its last throes. Within six weeks, Robespierre himself had been arrested by the very members of the convention who had processed with him up the montagne. Members who were increasingly worried that it was chop, chop, chop for them as government guillotined them. They turned on Robespierre, arrested him, and on the 28th of July, 1794, Robespierre, realizing he was cornered, tried to shoot himself, simply blowing off his jaw. 24 hours later, he was dead. And the cult of the Supreme Being was dead with him. After Robespierre's death, the revolutionary cult of the Supreme Being fell away. The people were eager for an end to such radicalism. As the assembly fought for control in the aftermath of Robespierre's death, an upwardly mobile young general took control of power for himself. His name was Napoleon. But his coup didn't lead to democracy and equality for all. By 1815, Napoleon himself had fallen from power. And the royals had returned, rebuilding the statue of good old Henri IV on the Pont Neuf built from the recycled bronze of a statue of one of Napoleon's favorite generals. It just goes to show the battle over who controls these symbols of power on the streets of Paris has never really ended. Just like Parisians of the French Revolution, from the moment that we step outside of our doors, we're in a world of images and symbols that demand our attention and even our loyalty. But we have to realize that these symbols shape our world and the way that we understand it and imagine it. The French Revolution shows us that those who control our symbolic world can never take their power for granted. There's always somebody who's willing to scrawl on a symbol, to pull it down, to smash it up, to smear it with shit, to set it on fire, or to make subtle and creative changes to it that create a new symbol. As Picasso taught us, the act of creation is always, first and foremost, an act of destruction. Catch up with Lucy Worsley's brand new series, The First Georgians, that's available now on BBC iPlayer. And there's acclaimed BBC drama here on BBC4 tomorrow and one of Hollywood's greatest love stories, Tempests, Trysts and Tantrums, in Burton and Taylor at nine.